Hello everybody, today we're going to be taking a look at my Kiapa Little Badger in 22 Long Rifle. As you can probably tell, this isn't a standard rifle, I've done quite a lot of work to it. Because these are quite cheap, this gun has actually kind of been a test bed for various bits of machine work um, and kind of hand fitting projects that I've been wanting to try and I, I needed a cheaper gun to test them out on. So yeah, I've done quite a lot of work to this and we'll get into that in a little bit. As usual though, I will start with the box, which is the weirdest looking uh, box you'll ever see a firearm come in. Very strange uh, shape, and it's very, very small, as you, can, as you can see, very thin. Doesn't really look like it would contain a rifle, and um, it, it doesn't right now, but anyway, you get the idea. Inside, you get a tiny a little backpack. <laughs> Uh, slip kind of thing. So it has actually got straps you can wear it on your back. Yes, it does look absolutely ridiculous uh, for a grown uh, <laughs> an adult to wear this, uh, but it's kind of cute. I kind of like it. And the gun is so tiny, it just it, it's incredibly loose in any of my proper gun bags. So it's actually nice it comes in something small to, to carry it about in. The whole thing's absolutely adorable. As adorable as a uh, firearm can be. Anyway, uh, you've got your manual, which covers both the little badger and the little squirrel. I really cannot figure out the difference between the two. I've seen the names used completely interchangeably between the different models of this gun and the shotgun version, because they make this in 22 long rifle, 22 magnum, uh, possibly 17 HMR. I didn't actually look that up. I think there might be a 17. Um, and they make it in 9mm Flaubert, which is a rimfire shotgun cartridge. Um, and they said they do sell those here in the UK as well. Uh, they're, they're called garden guns normally. So I'm, I'm not sure if the squirrel is the shotgun version and the badger is not. I've seen I've seen them used interchangeably. And it also co covers the double badger, which is a combination gun that they make. Uh, it's a decent enough manual. Um, nothing unexpected, really. Now, all of this stuff um, I've taken off of the gun. So those wouldn't be loose in the box when you get it. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. You get the gun uh, split in half, just in, in the polystyrene there. Very, very simple. All very compact, uh, but it does the job. Now, Kiapa themselves have quite a mixed reputation, and I understand why uh, why this is the case. Some of their guns are absolutely excellent. Really, like some of my favourites, like this Kiapa eighteen ninety two Trapper, which I still need to do a full video of. As you can see, I've replaced the rear sight on this one because uh, I don't really like buckhorn sights. This gun I've had for a couple of years now, and it's still one of my favourite rifles. It is superbly built, really, really well finished. Absolutely love this. Yet they have some other guns like their 22 caliber M1 carbine, and there's a 9mm version, which we obviously can't have in the UK. Uh, and various other guns, like some of their rimfire guns, are, are really cheap, and they're quite nasty. I've... Been, I've, I've had my hands on a few of those, including their M4 uh, and their 22 caliber M1 carbine, and honestly, they're quite horrible. So I really wasn't sure what to expect when I got one of these. Um, I was actually very pleasantly surprised. I'm really quite fond of this gun, as we'll get into in a bit more detail soon. So in regards to pricing, these cost under £200 in the UK, which is pretty cheap for a gun. Guns over here aren't... Uh, aren't favorably priced compared to those in the States. They tend to be fairly expensive uh, when compared directly, but this gun is pretty cheap here. Uh, my local gun shop, Brothers in Arms, actually sell these for a little bit less than that. I believe they were advertising them for more like 150 or 160 pounds. And this particular one was an X demo model that I got for even less than that. This one was um, just a hair over 100 pounds, if I remember right. Uh, like I said, it's an X demo one that had been passed around the shop quite a lot. I could see that uh, they'd that sort of shown a lot of people it, it it had a massive EOTech sight on it um it was just kind of a uh, a bit of a joke gun i think um but they were selling it for a pretty decently reduced price so i went ahead and got it like i said before you can get these in a few different calibers i'm sure the, the most common by far is the 22 long rifle which sure it really does make sense as a small light survival rifle cartridge they do also make a 22 magnum which I'm sure will be a lot of fun. I think uh, you get a great sort of blast from it in terms of, um, you know, a bit more punch than the 22 long rifle. However, my local club 
uh, but actually you, you can't shoot a 22 magnum because the velocity is exceeding the safety limits of the range. Uh, so I've I've got the 22 long rifle and that was what came up at a good price anyway. So definitely makes more sense for me. And it's just great to be able to shoot something like this that's very, very cheap to feed of ammunition. And because it's a single shot, you will use a lot less ammunition than you would with a semi-auto. So this is just an incredibly cheap, it'd be great as a, like a youth, a youth gun, a, a first gun, you know, like a something cheap to get someone started on. Okay, so let's talk about the configuration that the gun came in when it came out of the box. So how you would receive one of these. So out of the box, it has four 20 millimeter 1913 Picatinny rails attached to every side of the handguard, if you can call it a handguard, really the, the barrel shroud or the, yeah, that, that part. So you'd have four of these all around like that, top, bottom, both sides. Um, they're reasonably well molded. They're not like ultra cheap. But they are still plastic, and unless they're going to be reinforced in some way, you're pretty much always going to get some kind of flex with them, which they do definitely have. So, yeah, I took these off. I wasn't going to put a foregrip on it. I wasn't going to put any other accessories on. And I would say that if you're going to be using, <clears throat> let's say, a small optic, like a red dot and um, that kind of thing, or if you're going to be putting a laser on or a, or a flashlight, something reasonably small, these will be okay. You don't need to replace them. However, if you're going to actually mount a proper scope onto this, which I did try briefly when I first got the gun, these are simply not adequate in my experience. If the scope is very, very small and light and has a pretty solid, maybe large base on the rail, you might get away with it. But the one that I tried, it was very, very easy to flex the entire scope while it was on here. It's only got three very small screws holding it on. I think they're um, probably M3. M3 by 0.5 screws that so they are small there's only three of them and the rail is plastic and yeah any any substantial weight on these you, you will get some flex on them so uh, there are companies making metal versions there's an American company I think it's called long shot manufacturing or something to that effect that does make a full length top rail which I'd quite like to buy although I'm trying to keep this whole build very cheap which I'll talk about later with the budget accessories yeah, they make a full length top rail out of metal. And I think if you want to mount something on this in a serious manner, you're going to want to upgrade to something like that. Now, the sights that came on this gun are kind of horrible. I think they look quite cool. This is this is clearly off their M1 carbine. Um, the front's all right. It's, it's a very tall post. It's much taller than it sort of looks like it should be. I feel like it should be like there. But very tall front post, all plastic. It, it, it is a very tough, rigid plastic, I should say. Like there's basically no flex to them. So they did pretty well in terms of that. But it's a very thick front blade. It's very tall. And in combination with this rear sight, which sort of wobbles around, it's uh, again, it's quite a rigid material, but the way the whole thing's constructed doesn't feel all that solid. Now this hole I've actually made a little bit better and neatened it up. When I first got it, it was much smaller. And the aperture was kind of burred around the inside, like it wasn't a clear cut circle and it was just really distracting. Also note how it's like slightly flat on the top. The whole thing I just found, I don't know, I, I really didn't think I was going to get any decent accuracy out of it. So one of the first things I did is take these off. I just really didn't get on with them very well. Oh, and I should also add that even on its very lowest setting, uh, the gun was hitting very, very high, um, even quite up close, um, sort of 15, 20, 25 yards. The gun was hitting exceptionally high, uh, which means it even, needs, it, it even needs a taller front sight or a lowered rear sight. And in its very, very lowest setting to where the aperture was almost obscured by the, mount, uh, by the base of the sight, it was still hitting very high. So that was another reason to chuck these. If your one hits dead on and you get on with this style, then, then go for it. It's going to be cheaper than having to do something, you know, and replace them. But for me, these, these simply didn't work and I, I couldn't hit with them anyway. Okay, so with a couple of the negatives dealt with um, regarding the plastic parts on the gun, let's talk about the rest of it because there are some things that are really, really good about it. So the rest of the construction, aside from the plastic parts I already spoke about, is, it really is completely solid. The whole thing is made out of this cast metal that... In some areas, it's kind of cheap. Like you can see the lever to release the to break the gun open here has got quite a big seam down it, which doesn't look all that high quality. But the whole thing is very robust, and actually the um, the main sort of receiver here 
I'd say is made pretty well. It definitely feels solid and uh, like it'll last a long time. There is a slight difference in finish between the barrel portion here and the receiver. I noticed that both of them, I'm not sure whether it can really be described as bluing, but both of them had this finish that was quite thick in some areas, like it had been applied much more harshly in some areas and left a bit thin in the others. Uh, looked kind of looked kind of rough, looked pretty nasty. So what I did was just got some very fine uh, emery cloth and just sort of wiped over the whole thing, just kind of smoothed the finish down a little bit. And you can see where paint has clearly come off, or the finish has clearly come off of this area much more than it has this area. But overall, I think it looks quite cool. I think it kind of looks a little bit like a uh, post-apocalyptic kind of pipe gun from Fallout 4 or something like that. I think it's quite cool. In terms of markings, it's very basic. You can see it's just be, they've just been kind of electro penciled on in terms of the serial number and everything. There's a certain just sort of industrial crudeness about the whole thing, but I, I find there's actually some kind of appeal in that. It's quite nice just having a cheap, a cheap, indestructible feeling gun uh, that you don't really mind getting damaged. And that's why I use this gun as a test bed for, like I was saying before, some machining work. And we'll get onto that a little bit later. Uh, so you've got a big K, which I think is Kimar, or however you, you would say that, I believe, is maybe part of Kiapa, or maybe they bought the moulds from them. I'm not really sure, but I've seen these advertised previously, like a number of years ago, as Kimar guns. So I'm not sure what that's about, but they are marked Kiapa Firearms, Dayton, Ohio there. And here are the proof marks. Something rather curious about this is the inclusion of a very, very small rail. This isn't a Picatinny... Uh, a 20 millimeter size rail. This is like a miniature pick rail, uh, which is really strange. It also has a, a threaded screw hole in there. Now this allows you to attach stuff. So they do have a really, really ugly cleaning kit tube thing that sticks up in there. I think that was in the manual somewhere uh, there, which I think just looks absolutely horrendous. They do have a make a, I don't think it's in here, but they make a molded plastic or rubber Proper pistol grip looks a bit like a, a Hogue AR-15 uh, grip. I've been tempted to get that. Uh, however, it, it adds quite a bit of bulk to the gun. And despite this looking very uncomfortable, it's actually quite a comfortable gun to hold. It, you don't really notice the the bumps of the rail section there. It's, it's a very slim gun. And it's actually very easy to hold. That was something I was concerned about. I thought that I would have to change something or put something there to make holding it a bit more comfortable. But no, it's it's very comfortable. Hammer is an easy reach. You can see a big heavy coil spring in there. I've never had any misfires with this. It has a very reliable ignition. Something I should note is that where this gun was a... Uh, what's the word for it? Was a demo gun or like a... Uh, kind of like a show gun for the shop that I bought it from. It's very clear that it had been dry fired a few times, which is, of course, never recommended for a rim fire. And sure enough, if you look in here... Uh, just in there where the firing pin would strike it actually had deformed the metal inside from being struck so many times that when i first bought this a round wouldn't actually go into the chamber uh two seconds of a file and i sorted that out but i thought that was kind of interesting and just another one of those little anecdotal things do not dry fire rim fire guns in general um obviously some guns are maybe more prone to be damaged than others but yeah definitely with this one i noticed that the firing pin has been hardened to the extent where it will quite easily uh form the metal in the chamber to the shape of the firing pin and prevent a round from entering i would have complained if this was a more expensive gun but considering how cheaply i got it i wasn't too bothered and like i said a couple of minutes of a file sorted that out now breaking the gun open is very simple the lever is here i believe yeah, it does have its own spring, but it also relies a little bit to close on tension on the hammer. As you can see, as you as you bring the lever back, it brings it to half cock. And this is, of course, so when you slam it shut, the firing pin isn't sat forward. It's a very small firing pin, as you can see there. You wouldn't want the firing pin forward as you slam it shut. So doing that will automatically bring it to half cock. To make this even easier to pull, you can bring it to full cock if you want, but I wouldn't recommend that just based on safety because this has an incredibly light trigger. Now I don't have a trigger gauge to actually measure it with, and I'm not gonna slam it down with the gun open because, uh, with the gun closed, because I've already uh, described the problems I had there. Uh, but I'll just do one here. Not that that really gives you any idea, but it 
it's an incredibly crisp trigger. It's really surprising that a gun this cheap and this crudely built in some ways, if you look inside here, uh, the whole thing is cast in a relatively rough way. There's no sort of a real tight fit here. I mean, it's not bad. It's not like there's a huge amount of movement between everything, but you can tell this has really been built to a built to a price. Um, and nothing about it is fancy or really nice. However, the trigger is surprisingly good. And I have actually read a review that uh, stated that his one broke at two and a half pounds or something like that. So you do get a very surprisingly good trigger on this. Now, the stock is nothing to get too excited about. However, it's nothing to be too disappointed about either. This isn't the kind of thing that uh, it doesn't look as flimsy or as uncomfortable. Sorry, it, it isn't as flimsy or as uncomfortable as it definitely looks because it's just two pieces of bent wire held together um, by screws in here. It's, it's a little bit weird, actually. The The end of the, the, rod, end of the rod is threaded, and then half the thread is ground off. So it's like you have to split the receiver in half, place it in there, clamp it shut. These can't unscrew. Uh, it's a weird way of putting a stock into a <laughs> into a receiver. What you can actually do is pry the receiver open and adjust this very slightly for length. You can pull them out a little bit and then secure it back in there, uh, which is interesting because it only gives you an extra few centimeters. I probably wouldn't bother, uh, but yeah, it's it's quite nicely uh, made actually. It's it's pretty solid. There's no flex in it. Got a plastic pad on the end here and here you have some little clips for you to put your cartridges in which does make sense as it's meant to be a sort of survival rifle kind of thing they just clip in there like that you can fit 12 of them which kind of annoys me a little bit i wish it was just 10 that's a silly complaint but I, I'll, it would be nice if it was just 10 instead of 12. anyway with the design of the stock uh pretty straight like that without a pistol grip you can fold it fairly flat now, with the Picatinny rail on the bottom here that the, it comes with in the box, it limits this a little bit. It'll only close about there because of the rail in the way, but without the rail, it'll close even further. And if you move the lever back, you can close it even more till it's touching the trigger guard, and it is completely flat. Of course, I've got an optic on here, which kind of ruins that. But yeah, this is a, a really, really compact gun when folded up like this. Now, if you want to take the gun down further, it's pretty simple. Just gonna unscrew this with my finger. I don't keep it too tight because if you tighten this right down, then the operation of the uh, of breaking it open is compromised, and it makes it a lot harder to do so. I like I like it just sort of swinging open on its own. Anyway, if we remove that pin, uh, that screw there, push the pin through, and the whole thing comes apart very very easily into two pieces. Nothing too exciting here. It's just again a cast steel receiver finished reasonably well. The receiver is definitely better quality than the barrel piece, I believe. As you can see, it's kind of rough. It already had all these uh, marks when I got it, just from where it had been opened a number of times and the finish had worn off. Basic, but functional. You've got all those holes there if you want to screw in metal rails. They, Like I said, there's an American company making metal rails. Now, this one that I have on here is actually from a from the top of a Ruger 1022. The holes didn't line up perfectly, as you can see, there's a bit of overhang, but I just liked having a metal rail on it. So I uh, found a couple of screws that fit and I screwed this down and this is completely solid. There's no way this is going anywhere. Even though it doesn't fit perfectly, it's better than the plastic ones that the gun comes with. And on top of that, I have an incredibly cheap Chinese red dot sight. I spent so little on this gun. And like I said, I wanted to use it to test a few different things uh, in the workshop. So I thought, why why should I buy expensive accessories? Um, it's only going to be a little range toy, so let's just buy some cheap ones and see how they are. Uh, and this particular one that I actually got off Wish is actually pretty impressive. I've got to say that it cost me about twelve pounds, and it is a perfectly functioning uh, red and green dot sight. And uh, once I zeroed it in, it stayed exactly where it is because, of course, there's no recoil with the twenty-two. So um, I think that was a great little purchase actually for a gun like this. Now, if you've been thinking to yourself for the last 20 minutes, oh, that barrel looks a little bit short, you are correct. This isn't the standard length. Out of the box, it was either a 16 or an 18 and a half inch barrel. I can't actually remember. I think it was probably a 16 inch barrel. Might have been an 18. Either way, uh, it was a bit longer than I really wanted. You get decent accuracy and performance out of a 12 inch 22 barrel, and I only shoot them at 25 yards, so. I thought, let's shorten it, make it really compact. 
My actual goal was to be able to put a moderator or suppressor on this and for it to retain the same length that it had beforehand. So when you fold it, it matches up well. So yeah, if you can kind of envision what I'm trying to do there, I'll show you later with a moderator on. So yeah, I shortened the barrel down uh, using a uh, thread grinder. Well, with a hacksaw to start with and then a lathe and then a thread grinder. I threaded the end of it a uh, half inch 28 uh, pitch and which is pretty standard for 22 suppressors you can see i also fitted my own sights on here so rather than the original plastic ones that i complained about earlier this one which was just sort of fit on the fitted on there and had a grub screw in the top holding it down i wanted something a little bit more substantial and a bit more visible now these are actually sights off a uh, browning buckmark that i recently did a similar barrel shortening job to and actually i've got that here i need to do a review on this at some point really really cool gun so I shortened this buckmark carbine down to uh, about 13 inches on this one. Removed the rear sight and the front sight came off when I chopped the barrel, which is why it's got the little red dot on it. Really, really cool little handy gun this. I'll do a review of this at some point. Anyway, I had the sights lying around. So since it seemed to fit the profile of the barrel fairly well, as you can see there, I thought, why not uh, drill and tap the top of the barrel here, being careful, of course, not to go all the way through it. Uh, screw the high vis front sight on there and the rear I just sort of molded to the shape I wanted and screwed it down and as you can imagine they are pretty good they uh, they glow pretty nicely in the light as you can see here now they're no match for a red dot sight in terms of precision but I kind of like having a set of irons on here and if I was to have this in an actual survival kind of role I would probably get rid of the bulk and the complexity and the extra thing to damage that a red dot sight brings. And I'd probably just keep the little high-vis sights on there. They work pretty well. Uh, they, they make the gun a lot sleeker. Uh, so this is kind of the range configuration. But yeah, if I was to actually put this in a backpack, in the little included canvas backpack, I, I would take this off because it doesn't actually fit properly in the backpack with that on there. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of work that I did to it. The threading job was the first uh, job like that that I'd actually done before. I was a little bit concerned, but... Uh, came out very nicely and I bought some more cheap accessories for it. So this is a uh, about £10 this costs, a muzzle brake from Wish again. You can get some really good deals on Wish if it ever arrives. A lot of the stuff doesn't ever arrive but when it does you can actually get some pretty good stuff. So there's a little muzzle brake I've got, got on here. I also found possibly the cheapest moderator or silencer available which is the uh, £35 Wildcat Cub. Um, this is a an entirely plastic moderator. I didn't actually realise that when I bought it. I'd assumed that the internals were still metal. So I only paid about £35 for this. I assumed it was metal inside, which is why I went for it. Uh, when I got it actually um, in my hands and had a good look at it, it turns out the entire thing is made out of Delrin plastic, which is very rigid and tough and all that, but it still seems strange to be uh, shooting through a completely plastic unit. Uh, you can take it apart, as you can see here. It's pretty dirty inside. I've been using it a lot. Uh, it works all right. I'm not going to give it a, a glowing review and say it's uh, the best sort of value for money thing, but it, it is the cheapest. So if you just want a really cheap moderator, it does work. It definitely is quieter. Um, can't seem to get it screwed on now. There we go. So yeah, I, I don't like the fact that the threads are plastic as well. I'm sure eventually they're going to start to sort of round off or I'll just uh, twist too much and break them or something. But yeah, for 35 quid, it works pretty well. That's one thing I've got to say I do like about um, guns in the UK in general. Pretty much everything else sucks, but in terms of suppressors, they are very cheap and they're very easy to acquire. I've also got a much better built Wildcat uh, Predator, I think this one is. This was much more expensive. Well, not that expensive. It was about 150 quid. And this is a really good moderator. It takes uh, comes apart very easily. Very, very good noise reduction. But it's quite big for this, and it adds a lot of weight. Whereas the little Wildcat Cub adds barely any weight. So I think it's a pretty good match for this little survival gun. So here's the rifle back together with its uh, moderator on. We've got the rounds in the stock there. It's a really nice, handy little uh, sort of outfit overall. I like it. And just as I wanted, when you fold it in half, since I've shortened the barrel, the uh, the overall length of both of the parts uh, match pretty well 
And yeah, I mean, it's a great little shooter, I've got to say. Uh, I, I did a fair bit of shooting before I chopped the barrel down. I was careful with recrowning the barrel and everything uh, to the best I could with the tools I had. And accuracy remained very good afterwards. Really impressive. I, one thing I've got to say I'm not impressed with, which isn't anything to do with Kiapa, uh, but it does not like these uh, CCI Quiet 22s. I thought it'd be cool to use these super quiet, low velocity, 710 feet per second uh, rounds in this. I thought in combination with the short barrel and the cheap suppressor, I could, if I if I got the quietest stuff I could, then it would uh, it should be pretty quiet, you know, for uh, no hearing protection required. But those those are, just don't shoot well in it at all. They they're all right in some of my other twenty twos, but in this particular one, even before I chopped the barrel, so it's not something I've that I've done to it. I was getting groups of about a foot at fifteen yards. Uh, so if you're going to get one of these, I would not recommend the CCI Quiet 22s. I'd go for uh, what I've been using, uh, the Subsonic 22 hollow points, which would be great for small game, obviously. Yeah, these, these, these shoot well and they're cheap enough anyway. They're much cheaper, actually, than the Quiet 22s. They're quite expensive. So, yeah, these work These work well in them. When I don't have the moderator on there, I use Mini Mag. And you get a nice little crack out of that short barrel. Overall, really, really impressed with the performance, actually. Um, I don't think I've actually kept any targets to show you, but uh, the kind of ranges I shoot, 25 yards, with the red dot zeroed in well, you're talking well under an inch at 25 yards. I think with a proper scope on there, you could maintain those groups out much further. I simply don't shoot any further than that um, with, my, with my regular target shooting. But this isn't a case of a cheap gun uh, only being good for plinking. I would say... Yeah, with a half decent optic and not the included iron sights, you're, you could be capable of really good accuracy out to a respectable distance, pretty much on par with any other 22 caliber rifle. I've owned quite a few 22s at this point, and this is probably one of the nicer shooting ones, to be honest. The trigger's excellent, much better than you'd get with a stock, say, a, a Ruger 1022. This this trigger's well better, way better than that. And accuracy is easily on par. So for the price you can pick these up for, if you have a need or a, just a desire for a single shot rifle, I think these are great little things. Uh, like I was saying earlier on, it's really nice to have something that's robustly built, but at the same time nice and cheap, so you don't feel bad about it getting marked up and getting beaten around a bit. I think this would be a great gun to keep out on a farm, maybe in a, in a truck, uh, just for pest control. I really, yeah, love it. Great little gun. I can't imagine selling this. I remembered something. I do not like that the extractor on this gun only opens itself once it's open there starts going about there so it's practically 90 degrees where it starts to open if you're shooting from prone or you know reasonably close to a shooting bench or anything this gets a little bit annoying because whereas on some guns that don't open all the way fully single shot guns um, by about there the extractor will present itself so you can grab the empty and fling it out on this you have to consciously move the gun away from the bench, let it open about 90 degrees, and then it's open enough. That's quite annoying. Don't know if there's any way of uh, changing the geometry of the extractor, but yeah, a little bit annoying. Thought I'd better mention that just in case you do a lot of shooting from maybe prone, like lying down kind of stuff. Gets a little bit frustrating that the gun has to be broken down right down to there, really, before the extractor opens to its full extent. Actually... It opens fully about there, which is well beyond the 90 degree mark. So bear that in mind. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed the review. Lots more coming this way. I've acquired lots of new guns recently, like that uh, Browning Buckmark I was talking about. And I'm going to do my best to try and upload a little more frequently because I think it's been about a year, which is pretty embarrassing since my last one. So yeah, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more.